Hi, thank you for joining me, Emily, on Temple Not Made by Hands. Today I want to talk about snakes and introduce this new series of Not All Snakes Bite. Not all of them bite. And today we're going to talk about the one that saves. And we're going to look at the antivenom that we have been equipped with to neutralize the power of Satan in our life. But then we need to ignite a fire to make him flee from our lives also. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. If you are unclear of any of the language in the Bible, because he is referred to as a serpent, he's referred to as a dragon, he's referred to as Lucifer, the devil, uh, Satan. If we're confused of any of that or unsure, Revelation 12, 9 makes it clear. It says, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil, and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So this is an important series that I'm doing because he has set out to deceive the world. But God has not let, let us be powerless. We are not powerless through Christ Jesus, but we have to recognize what our weapons of warfare are. We have to recognize the strategies of the enemy so that we know how to overcome him. So we're not duped. Luke um, 10, 19, it says, Behold, I give you the authority to trample all serpents, and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing by any means shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So we are not to rejoice in the authority that we have. That will lead to pride. And that is why he strongly warns. Because in in this chapter 2, he says, Satan was kicked out of heaven for that pride. And he's always going to try to sneak into our lives by manipulating us with our own pride. So that is why Jesus is warning, do not rejoice in the authority that you carry through me. But what are we to rejoice in? That our names are written in heaven. All of this power begins with our ability to recognize and rejoice in our position as a child of God. And then Satan will creep in when he can make us become unaware or doubt our position as a child of God. That's where he starts to gain power in our life. But that is also where the power in our life begins. It begins by recognizing and rejoicing in our position as a child of God. We will never be able to take hold of the promises of God if we keep doubting the power of God and his promises. So rejoice, child of God. That is our first First weapon in our arsenal is to recognize our position. But then we are also told here that they are spirits. And then it says serpents. We have power and authority over serpents. So that is multiple. That means more than one. And the only ones that I know of that are mentioned in the Bible are the cobra, the viper, and the python. So... They have different strategies, and I want to look at their strategies because that will help us respond differently. We know that the antivenom of the blood of Jesus Christ is enough to neutralize our sin. It's enough to separate us from our sin, to separate us as far as the east is from the west. Our sin will be separated from us because of the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. But here's the problem. Not all snakes bite. Not all snakes bite. So what do we do about those? What do we do about the snakes that don't bite? Well, I'll go ahead and give you the answer now, but you're going to have to stick with me to unpack this series and elaborate on it and to really be able to pick up the tools. But every snake is afraid of fire. 
So that is what the purpose of this series is for, is to recognize the strategies that we're applying the right things to it, that we are neutralizing this in with the antivenom of Jesus Christ. But then we're setting fires that will set the send the serpents fleeing. That is the purpose. So I don't know if you're aware in, of how antivenom was developed. And that's what we have to start this off with. I'm just going to start it off with that. Antiventum was, uh, an antivenom was developed by taking the poison from a snake and then injecting it into a horse and then taking that blood and then applying it. And then that produces the antibodies to neutralize its effect. So they did it first on a horse. And that was pretty effective. But then they took the venom of a snake and they applied it to a lamb. And that was more effective. And so I don't know if you know anything about that white horse that's coming and the lamb that is riding on him. But that is enough to take away the sin of the world and to scare away every single snake. We are hidden in Christ Jesus, the Savior of the world. That antivenom was placed into the lamb so that it could create all the antibodies that it needed to uh, to to take away the effects of the poisonous venom, to neutralize it. But then that was taken out of the lamb and can be injected into any person that will receive it, any person that will apply that blood. And it is enough to neutralize all of the poison of that venomous snake. The blood of Jesus is enough all by itself, all by itself. I don't know if you've ever questioned um, the verse that we have in John 3, where it talks about God being a snake. Listen to this verse as I uh, read it to you. And it says, and it's chapter 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn it, but that the world through him might be saved. So he is making a reference of uh, Moses in Numbers 21, and the people were starting to get discontent and um, uh, because of the monotony of their life. And they were heading to the promised land and they started to get discouraged. One of Satan's first line of attack is always going to be to get us discouraged and discontent as with our position as a child of God. So they started, it was taking longer. The promise was taking longer than they wanted it to. They were eating manna day after day after day. And then they started to complain about the provision of God because they were stuck in monotony and they took the miracles of God as a common thing and they lost the awe and wonder of it. And they started to complain against God. And then listen to what they said about this miracle of manna. Worthless bread is what they called it. They started to curse their own blessings. Our blessings will become curses when we stop trusting God. So God sent fiery snakes. So that represents the poison. They were uh, being poisoned by these snakes. And then they cried out and they started repenting and they asked Moses, please pray. And then God instructed Moses when Moses prayed to intercede for these people. God said to make a fiery serpent, a bronze serpent, and to put it on a pole and lift it up. And anybody who looks at that snake will be saved. They will be healed from the venomous poison that they had just been bit, bitten with. Anybody who looks at that snake, it's hard to uh, process God as a snake. Why would he put himself that way? But was the cross not 
the punishment for the curse? Did he not identify with man? Did he not take on the sin of the world? Did he not take our place on the cross? He did. So when he identifies himself as a snake, it's his identity with humanity and his ability to take on the sins of the world because he is the only worthy sacrifice, the only one without blemish, the only sinless God. And he became sin who knew no sin. And he did that so he could take away the sin of the world. This isn't the only time God is represented in um, as a snake. When Moses was carrying that staff, he carried that snap staff and it became a snake. And then he first used it to demonstrate that we could take it by the tail and it would become a, a rod. We have power and authority over the snakes. So he was proving that to Moses first. But then in front of Pharaoh, he let that rod become a snake. And then guess what? They replicated that. They all became snakes too. And then that snake, the rod of God, swallowed up every counterfeit, every other snake. He swallowed it up, representing the one true living God. And that's what the a rod that Moses was carrying represents. It's the rod of God that represents the one true living God. So there's one snake that saves. His name is Jesus Christ, the one that knew no sin, but became sin that we might be saved. That one, that one provided the antivenom that we needed to overcome every sin, to neutralize the sin, but not all snakes bite. So we also need the fire of the Holy Ghost to empower us to take hold of all that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of for us. We need the Holy Ghost to empower us to set captives free. We need the Holy Ghost to take back all that which the enemy has tried to take back from us, us the wind of the Spirit to renew and revive our health, our ministries, our families, our life. God by himself will do it. But we have to make room for the Holy Spirit. But we can't have no room for the Holy Spirit till we've neutralized the sin in our life. So I hope you're going to pay attention to this series. This is just the introduction. So hopefully you're getting excited about it. And then you'll stay with me as we talk about the cobra, the viper, and the python. Thank you for tuning in and I can't wait to see you next time.